Shreya Rath. Uh, uh, she, she's a research fellow at, uh, at IASC uh, with a specialization in uh, security studies. Um, and uh, uh, he um, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Central Eastern European region, from a multidisciplinary point of view, um, uh, it, it is uh, her, her perspective. Uh, she's currently working on exploring development opportunities in Ria, Ria Island, Slovakia, uh, and uh, she uh, has uh, an MA in Non-Proliferation and International Security from King's College London and uh, an MSc uh, in Politics and Communication from the London School of Economics. Uh, uh, dear Osha, uh, we are happy to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Chaba, and uh, hello, everyone. I do have a presentation, so let me try to share my screen. Um, yes. Can you see my presentation? Okay, great. Uh, so I I will try to uh, keep the time limits. Uh, so what I will try to do, given my expertise is more on the international political and policy level, so I will approach the, the concept and topic of human security in light of uh, the current uh, security threats and other challenges in the 21st century and explore some of the uh, consequences on the international political as well as policy level. Uh, so the concept of security has been redefined over the years, decades as well as centuries as well, but just alone uh, in the 21st century, uh, our understanding of security can be actually very diverse. Um, uh, let me, so for example, uh, when we are dealing with uh, war, uh, which is unfortunately happening right now, uh, the concept for security can be understood uh, in a traditional sense as a survival. However, uh, when we are talking about the impact uh, of the war on a global scale as well as regional scale, when we will uh, then we will experience the economic crisis, financial crisis, um, as well as energy crisis. It will shift uh, towards a broader understanding of security, uh, which impacts our life and quality of life in general. Uh, so let me quickly summarize what I will talk about. So I will be mentioning uh, the threats in the 21st century as the pandemic. Uh, uh, which exacerbated the supply chain crisis. Um, uh, then I will briefly talk about the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine, which is exacerbating uh, the energy crisis, high inflation, uh, and leading into a food crisis on a global scale as well, uh, while we are heading into a post-pandemic recovery, which is itself a challenging process. Uh, however, in spite of these challenges, there are other uh, long-term risks that are not going anywhere, and this is the emerging global role of China, both as a military and technological power, as well as uh, climate change and climate-related risks, uh, which have been covered already, I believe, in detail. So when it comes to the pandemic, uh, so if you remember, uh, COVID-19 has spread uh, in a very, very short time span, it was announced or declared as a public health emergency at the beginning of 2020. And by March, by mid-March that year, it has spread throughout the world. Uh, especially the first half of the pandemic has been incredibly challenging given, given the absence of vaccination as well as approved medical treatment. Uh, however, uh, in spite of a widely available vaccination and approved and authorized vaccination we are talking about, we are still facing challenges to vaccinate the population on a global scale. Just alone in the US, in a developing country, in a, sorry, in the developed country, uh, only 29% of the population have received the booster. 
However, uh, this rate uh, gets much worse when we look at numbers from the developing world. Uh, so if we think back in September 2021, uh, WHO called for 20% of the world population to be vaccinated by mid-2022. And at that time, so in September last year, it was only just 3% of people in low income countries that had been vaccinated with at least one dose. So there we are talking about one dose only. And here we are already talking uh, in 2022 about boosters. So that rate of uh, when it was 3% in low income countries in September 2021, in high income countries, that was around 60%. Uh, in January 2022, this number uh, in low-income countries has risen to only 5%. So here we are talking about one-digit numbers in the developing world. So in spite of COVAX, uh, this remains to be a huge challenge. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because if, uh, if large parts of the population remain un unvaccinated globally, it will make the shift from a pandemic towards an endemic status very, very difficult, both in sh short, medium, as well as long term. So consequences uh, on, the, on the policy and political level uh, were very visible uh, once COVID hit. And uh, you can observe a country first approach, very typically first closing borders uh, in multiple countries uh, right when COVID hit. Uh, but even more visible case is the fight for the vaccines once available. So kind of every man himself uh, approach was very, very visible uh, in between countries globally. And this had an impact on the very, still very low vaccination rate in the developing world that I just mentioned. Um, basically, the result is very visible of this country first approach um, reaction. Uh, and then came the war in Ukraine on a, on a both conventional and unconventional warfare level. Uh, as mentioned before, during a conventional warfare on the territory, human security is understood in a traditional sense, which is simply survival during wartime. Um, but uh, as I mentioned already, uh, the war has multiple spillover effects that are that spill beyond Ukraine, but also beyond the region to a global scale, which is a serious energy crisis, as well as surging inflation and trade disruptions, uh, which will become even more challenging uh, as time passes. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, the consequences on the political as well as policy level have been very mixed. Uh, as we can remember, there are, of course, cleavages even between EU member states when it comes to specific topics. Uh, for example, the energy crisis, uh, the sanctions and then specifically on oil and gas. So there have been some misunderstandings between countries. However, we are still observing an increased sense of unity, at least at the very least in terms of rhetoric, uh, both from EU level as well as NATO level. Uh, and even more interestingly, we are seeing a shift on a security and political landscape as well, uh, which is Sweden and Finland, traditionally uh, non-aligned uh, neutral countries on becoming uh, candidates uh, to become NATO members. Uh, which is, a, as, as you know, it's a huge historic shift. Uh, from these countries who have been primarily engaged in crisis operations, for example, in Africa, but taking a very, very neutral stance and never, uh, never uh, involving in direct warfare. As well as, you know, Ukraine becoming an EU candidate uh, country, receiving the candidate status is also a very uh, 
very visible political shift, even if the accession itself will take years, if not decades. Um, oh, I apologize for, uh -huh, okay. Uh, so last but not least, let me just very briefly touch upon climate change since this has been already uh, covered in a greater extent. So as we know, climate change is one of our probably, if not the key challenges of our times. Uh, the past three summers have been the hottest uh, as well as we are experiencing category four and five uh, hurricanes, the largest in the past five years. Uh, what's becoming even more of a challenge is that global warming is simply a force multiplier because these extreme weather events are becoming even more uh, frequent and severe, leaving less time for the Earth to recover. So, a clear shift is uh, climate change becoming a security challenge, uh, which uh, was stated uh, in 2021 June by NATO Secretary General at the Brussels summit. Um, Stoltenberg declared uh, climate as a trans transboundary ecological crisis, not, not just a transboundary ecological crisis, but a security crisis as well. Uh, and this is a very key development from NATO, which is primarily a traditional security organization dealing with collective security and defense. So this is a clear shift in political thinking that we are seeing. The climate change and security action plan was adopted at the summit, broken down into four implementation categories. It, time will show to what extent uh, the commitment uh, to these goals, as well as um, concrete uh, policy processes, will be developed to fight this challenge. Mm, let me conclude my presentation uh, with the fact that all of these challenges or crises and just alone in the 21st century, including COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis in Ukraine, as well as the challenges coming from these major issues that, that I mentioned, energy crisis, supply chain disruptions, trade disruption, high inflation, um, they mean that or they show us that today's threats uh, cannot be faced or defeated solely on a country level but they but they require an enormous global coordination and cooperation efforts uh, where the role of intergovern intergovernmental organizations supranational institutions uh, as well as interstate mechanisms, uh, meaning regular high-level meetings of world leaders will be key, with as well as an active society contribution to, to drive a change. And uh, I believe that uh, this summer university is happening at a very interesting time because the G7 as well as the NATO summit is happening right now. Uh, so I would advise uh, to keep an eye on the developments to what extent, for example, climate will be covered during these summits, what will be the outcomes, as well as what will be the approach uh, towards the towards the developing security situations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>